Hey guys, today we're going to take a look at topic 5.2, uh, which is in regard to the heating effects of electric currents. So let's take a look at our learning objectives. First, you need to be able to use particle theory to explain how conductors acquire thermal energy from electric current. You need to be able to describe Ohm's law, which should be reviewed from topic 10 physics. You need to be able to draw and interpret circuit diagrams. Uh, we're not going to cover that in great detail today, but we will definitely cover it for the end of topic five. You need to be able to identify ohmic and non-ohmic conductors through consideration of the voltage versus current graph. Finally, uh, you need to be able to solve problems involving potential difference, current charge, Kirchhoff's circuit laws, power resistance and resistivity, we're not going to cover all of this today either. Okay, uh, first thing we need to talk about is conductivity and the particle theory of matter. So in the lower right hand corner here, uh, you can see our zinc ions. And as we discussed in topic five, electrons in an electric field are accelerated in the opposite direction of the field. So if we apply an electric field in any direction through this conductor, the electrons will move the other way. So these electrons, uh, if they're being accelerated, are obviously going to gain kinetic energy. They have mass, they have velocity, they have kinetic energy. Okay, so uh, the electrons are then going to bump into these ions, the zinc ions, and when they do that, they're going to dump off their kinetic energy. Okay, so as the ions and the conductor gain kinetic energy, their average velocity increases. In other words, they begin to vibrate uh, faster and more violently. Okay, so following the collision and loss of kinetic energy, the electron will be re-accelerated by the electric field and this process is going to repeat, okay? So remember the electron, after the collision, it's still an electric field, so it just accelerates again and continues on its way. Recall from topic three that temperature is defined by the average kinetic energy of particles in a substance. So if our average kinetic energy of our positive ions in the metal conductor increases, uh, then we will have a higher temperature. So this whole relationship can be summarized by this. More current uh, means more kinetic energy and a higher temperature of our conductor. Okay, so next we need to look at resistance in relationship with Ohm's law. Okay, so remember that resistance is a function of the potential dif difference across a circuit component divided by the current flowing through it. In other words, some component will have resistance. In fact, all components have at least a little resistance. And uh, if you take the potential difference across that component and divide it by the current, you've got your resistance. So the more easily current flows through an object, the lower its resistance must be. And Ohm's law, and again, you will recall this from topic five, is given by resistance is equal to potential difference divided by current, and your data booklet has this as R equals V divided by I. So the potential difference or voltage across a component divided by the current through that component. Okay, so we need to look at ohmic versus non-ohmic resistors, and I'll define those terms shortly. So uh, when the temperature of a metal conductor is kept constant, its resistance should stay constant also. But if you change the temperature of a conductor, its resistance is going to change significantly. Why, 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 why? Good question, Bry. I'm glad you asked. Uh, it's because the more kinetic energy the atoms have, the more likely they are to collide with those electrons. They will be effectively occupying more space with their violent vibrations. Okay, So they're more likely to collide with an electron, and the more collisions that occur, uh, the more kinetic energy those ions will gain. gain. 
I should say collisions, not collision. Typo. Okay, so uh, ohmic resistors are characterized by a linear, um, meaning proportional relationship between voltage and current. And that looks like this. Note that this is not actually the norm. Ohmic resistors have to be manufactured uh, because most conductors are actually non-ohmic, as we'll see here in a second. So, so resistors that you would buy in an electronics store are uh, specialized components that need to be made so that they will have this ohmic relationship. So non-ohmic resistors are going to have uh, this distinctive curve. It is non-linear. Uh, and what happens is that as you increase the uh, voltage or current, the resistance will increase as well. Okay, so uh, diodes are special kinds of resistors. Uh, they only allow current to flow in one direction. Okay, so they're gonna have very high resistance for a negative potential difference, and this is very much non-ohmic. Uh, you will note that the current versus voltage here is relatively consistent. So you just get this nice sharp spike. So these are very useful in electronics, as you will definitely see as we continue to study uh, topic 5 and topic 11. You may also be familiar with what are called light-emitting diodes, uh, and those are diodes, obviously, that emit light, LEDs. Um, you undoubtedly have many LEDs in your house right now. Okay, another example of a non-ohmic resistor is called a thermistor. And as you can see here, uh, what happens is resistance changes depending on the temperature of the component. Okay, note for any of these charts, we can analyze resistance at any given data point. So if you take the uh, voltage and divide it by the current, at any point you will have the resistance at that point. So some factors affecting resistance. First factor is the nature of the material itself. So what is it made of? Um, which conductor, which metal? Um, different metals will uh, be a huge factor in the amount of resistance the structure has, okay? Next thing would be the length of the wire. Uh, if we're using the word wire, that kind of implies heavily. We're talking about metal conductors. Also, uh, the cross-sectional area of the wire itself. So these are the three things that we need to consider. So resistance of material is determined experimentally. Um, it's usually the easiest way to handle stuff like this. So. How will the second and third factors affect resistance? Good question. I'm glad you asked. First, resistance is proportional to length. In other words, the longer the conductor, the more resistance you have. And remember, the reason for that is because you will have more opportunities for those collisions, okay? The longer the conductor is. So your electron accelerates, bumps into an atom, accelerates, bumps into an atom, or should say ion, and that process repeats. And the longer the conductor is, the more ions uh, your electrons can bump into, okay? So directly proportional. Next, uh, resistance is inversely, inversely proportional to cross-sectional area. You can kind of think of this as um, like traffic, automobile traffic. So Many Japanese streets are very narrow, and you, the cars can't go very fast on these narrow streets, but if you go out onto the uh, freeway, you can go a lot faster. It's easier to move around. You are less likely to run into stuff. So it's the same thing here with electricity. So as your cross-sectional area increases, your resistance will decrease. Finally, resistance is proportional to uh, rho, which is resistivity. 
This is determined experimentally and it will vary depending on the material. So this is the factor that is related to the material. So for example, uh, copper will have a specific value for rho, and that will be different than you would expect to find for another metal such as nickel or a completely different kind of uh, conductor like carbon fiber. Okay, resistance is not the same as re resistance definitely do not confuse them. So every conductor has different resistivity. I've already talked about this. Um, generally though, it's going to be provided to you in a table or the problem that uh, you are asked to tackle, okay? So if you're not sure what the re resistivity of a substance is, uh, you should be able to look it up. Just look it up. Jump on the internet, look it up. You'll get the answer. Uh, in an exam style situation though, it is definitely going to be provided. These are not in the data booklet, so there's no big table in the data booklet, um, so just be aware. Okay, voltage. A uh, potential difference across a component is often called voltage. Uh, the unit is in volts for a potential difference, so you can see why this makes sense. Um, they're basically used interchangeably. If the resistance and current flowing through an object is known, then its voltage can easily be calculated by rearranging Ohm's law, such that V is equal to IR. Um, the other equation is a little bit more accurate because uh, the resistance is in fact a function of voltage and current. Um, but this is a little easier to remember, so whatever works for you. Um, it's not in the data booklet in this form, but it is in the previous form that we discussed. Okay, power. What is power? Uh, Q laugh track. It's my favorite joke. It's funnier in person, I guess. Anyway, uh, power is equal to current times voltage, and this is also equal to energy divided by time. And you should have power is equal to energy divided by time burned into your brain. It is one of those equations, uh, one of those relationships that comes up in physics again and again and again and again and again and again. So every time you think of power, the first thing you could should think of is energy per time, joules per second. Okay, the unit is a watt, and a watt is not actually a super useful uh, unit, but a joule per second is a very useful unit, and that is the one I re recommend that you uh, keep in your head. Obviously, you need to know what a watt is as well. Okay, uh, we can use Ohm's law and a little substitution to do some useful tricks here. So if power is equal to current times voltage and voltage is equal to current times resistance, then power then must be equal to current squared times resistance, okay? Um, so if you know the current and resistance of a component, you could waste time and calculate its voltage or you could skip that step uh, and just go straight to this relationship. So using the same substitution technique with current, uh, we find that power is equal to voltage squared divided by resistance. So both of those are useful uh, permutations of the power equation. Just a shortcut, just a shortcut. You don't actually need them, but um, it'll make your life easier if you know them. All right, my sources for this presentation, as usual, are SOCOS, the excellent SOCOS Physics for the IB Diploma. Uh, this Futurama image was nicked from this website. Uh, the metallic bonding image was nicked from this website. And I used Google Slides image flip and LaTeX to prepare this. Okay, guys, have a great day.